Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 193 of Category 5 Technology TV. Great to see you. It's Tuesday, May the 31st, 2011. Folks, yeah. Where did it go? Where did it go? June. And it's feeling like summer out there today. Oh, it's crazy. It was like freezing last week. And it's yeah. boiling today. Last week I couldn't put out my garden because we were going to have frost on Thursday. And it's like, what, like 30 degrees today? Amazing. I'm Robbie Ferguson. It's good to see you. I'm Krista Wells. And Hillary is going to be joining us for the news. Uh, in the meantime, I'll let you know what's uh, what's coming up. We've got uh, Skype that went down just uh, about two weeks after it was acquired by Microsoft. <laughs> like we didn't see that good. coming. <laughs> oh, we'll just slip in some new features. Oh, it's offline. And down. She'll be telling us more about that in uh, just about a half hour. Uh, Apple's CEO Steve Jobs is going to uh, make a trip uh, to the big stage next week at uh, and he's going to be making some announcements about iOS 5 as well as their iCloud service. Apparently it's no big whoop, but Linux 3.0 is going to be released very soon. And also uh even when you think you're buying a Linux smartphone, if you think you're sticking it to Microsoft, did you know that you could actually be putting some money in their pocket? So stick around, Hillary's going to have some news for us in about a half hour. Uh in the meantime tonight, uh we're welcoming your viewer point uh your viewer questions. <laughs> I'm thinking viewer points because I know we've got some uh, some photos to look at, uh, but we do have uh, uh, we're we're opening up the chat room if you want to get your questions in. Uh, Krista's watching there. Make sure you say. And now, are you Krista tonight, or are you like awesome no, Krista or Krista just the Krista awesome? Tonight. No All high right. expectations. All right, I will op Krista. So, if you're in the chat room, just say Krista Robbie F, and then your question, and that will uh, hopefully get our attention a little easier. Uh, we ask that you not flood, and Gadwill will kind of uh, help to maintain that. But uh, at the same time, uh, we do want to get your questions in tonight, so uh, so do your best to, to snag our attention when we're uh, in between stuff. Uh, and we've got uh, our email address is live at category5.tv if you need to do so by email. But the chat room during a live show is a great way to get uh, to get your questions in. All right, so as I was saying, we've got some viewer. Uh, viewer photos that were submitted this week, and as, as you know, uh, this week's challenge for viewer points, this is for 100 viewer points, Holy is smokes. to, yeah, that's a <laughs> lot, that's a lot. Ten of those will get you your first award. Uh, so this week's is, uh, is once again, uh, we want to see Category 5 TV being displayed the way that you watch the show. So uh, it's rather interesting to see, you know, people watch it on their mobile devices, people watch it on big screen TVs, and then of course there's uh, there's those of us that uh, that just watch it on the computer as well. Um, so first up, for 100 points, we've got Dan Murphy who works from home and uses this setup to watch Category 5 technology TV. It looks pretty good. Uh, we've got an iPad there on the right, a computer tower further right, and uh, what a laptop on the left, and a couple of computer monitors. So lots of room for the chat room. Uh, lots of room to uh, to watch the show full screen as well, and uh, very very cool. So Dan, we will uh, we'll throw 100 viewer points your way, and uh, thanks for sending that in. Also, I've got one here from Jawar, who uses a Mac connected to the big screen TV. Now, as Ooh. as you recall, this was actually uh, this this uh, gentleman had sent us a video last week, and I said, ah, we gotta we've got to actually see Category Five up on your screen, and there he is. Uh, <laughs> very nice screen grab. And uh, what happened is he explained that, well, I, I, I actually used my Mac to take the picture with the webcam. So I couldn't mm. have the show up on the screen because I used the Mac to actually display the show. So good excuse. We'll let you away with that. There's another 100 viewer points for you, Jawar. All right, next up we've got Shaw Liv, who has XBMC running on a Giada Slim N20 unit. There we go. <laughs> One of these times it's going to load properly. There we go. That's very cool. So it looks like a nice size Toshiba screen. I guess one of these computers is running XBMC. Uh, XBMC. Very cool. Very cool. 
and we will uh, we will throw a hundred viewer points. Thanks for submitting that. Uh, that's from Shaw Live again, and uh, we welcome you to send in your viewer uh, pictures. If you uh, if you want to snap a picture of yourself watching Category Five TV on your device, be it a, a mobile device, be it a big screen TV, or even just your computer, we'd love to uh, we'd love to have a picture of how you watch the show. Uh, so send that in. You can send it to live at category five dot TV. We'd love to see it. Cool. Give right. away three hundred viewer points tonight. Holy smokes! You're just throwing them out. Yeah. Giving them away. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just ch double checking, just making sure we're good. I guess we can jump right into viewer questions. So Great. again, I'll remind you: join us in the chat room, category five dot TV, or if you're on Freenode, that's an IRC chat uh, system. Uh, server, you can just uh, go into the Category Five channel as well, and we'd love to get your questions in. Um, and tonight, we're gonna—we're really just gonna rock the viewer questions. Uh, we've been doing a, our, our web development series for the past twelve—well, twelve weeks. Um, so we really want to uh, just take some time for you, the viewers, and and uh, give you a chance to get your questions in. And and we'll certainly do our best to uh, to help you if you have questions about technology. I always say. You know, if you if it's a software-related issue or hardware, or if you just need some advice, if you've gone into the store and you're not sure which laptop to buy, for example, you know, we'll, we're here for you. So, uh, so send your question in. Great. Cool. Well, let's start off. Our first question is from Jonathan, who joins us from Texas. Hey, Jonathan. He says, "Thank you for a great show. I found Cheers. Category Five through Miro, and I've been watching over six months now." I've been trying to watch live and get into the chat room. I'm glad I was able to be there last week because I won a pogo plug. Awesome. Yeah. I've been following the web dev series closely as I have a few sites I would like to build. I work in systems administration, mainly using Windows, and I'm trying to branch out into some of, more, some of the more creative aspects. Linux is my OS of choice, and I have been working on development with Joomla. Joomla. Sure. My <laughs> eyes are blurry. I feel just lucky to there. have Category just... 5 as a resource. Cool. So just a bit of a testimonial mm -hmm. there. Uh, and I'd encourage you to, to consider submitting a viewer testimonial on our website because that's kind of like our time capsule for that kind of thing. Uh, but nice to know that, uh, one, you found us through Miro, and two, that uh, you're enjoying the show and getting a lot out of the series that we've been providing. So it's nice to have you along. And uh, if you have any suggestions for the show or if you have any questions in particular, uh, your questions on the show are kind of what guide uh, the way that uh, each episode goes. It's a unique format. Um, as the questions, of course, are going to really mm -hmm. control where things go with the episodes. So thanks for your email. Excellent. Our next email is from Todd. He says, do you see any point in using a swap partition on today's modern systems? Now that processors are ridiculously fast and many systems have more than enough physical memory, why would anyone still want or need to use swap space? Thanks. Hmm. Definitely a valid question. Um, I would say in my opinion, that swap space is still something that you want to have, and that's because um, basically L Linux is going to use your swap space for, for a couple of reasons, but one is if you don't have enough RAM for the running applications or the open files. For example, if I've got GIMP open and I've got uh, a huge amount of image data loaded into the uh, to, to memory, uh, that data has to be stored somewhere, be it RAM, be it the hard drive. But if you've got 12 gigs of RAM, then most likely you're never going to exceed that uh, during normal use. But it is possible. And, and the way that Linux operates is it knows, well, if I need to swap, I've got this extra space, and usually you want it to be... Uh, no, these days, I mean, the amount of swap space that you have is, is probably not as relative to the amount of RAM that you have, especially when you've got you know 8 to 12 gigs or even more. But uh, it's still good to have that. And the other thing is that if, if there's an application that's running that's not actually doing anything, uh, let's say you, just to put it in a, in a real simple sense, if you've, got, you've opened a spreadsheet and it's been minimized for three hours and Linux says, ah, this doesn't need to be taking up RAM, swaps it to the hard drive to free up RAM so that other applications can now take that uh, and, and use that paging space. So. Um, that said, then you bring up the application, puts it back into RAM. So it, it's just a, a way that Linux maintains your RAM and keeps things running smoothly. And then again, you've got, you know, these days you've got solid state hard drives. So now the whole thing about hard drives being so slow is not as much of an issue with regards to swap space. But a couple of things you can do, which are kind of interesting, is get into your terminal in Linux. And use the, the swap on dash s command 
and I'm just doing this on my computer here. And one of the things that you notice is that, okay, I've got swap space. So, oh, here's what I've done, sudo swap on dash s. And it shows me that my swap drive is SDA3. It's whatever that is, 80, 87 or 8 gigs, 8.7 gigs. Uh, but used is zero because I haven't exceeded the amount of RAM that's in my system. So regardless, I mean, you're talking about, well, if we have this much RAM these days, why, does it, why do we need it? If we have hard drives that are a terabyte in size or hundreds of gigabytes in size, what is allocating 24 gigs to your, to your swap space? I mean, it's, it's absolutely nothing. Not that you'd ever swap that mm -hmm. much. But you know what I mean? Like, it, it's so minimal. I've got eight gigs on my laptop that are dedicated for swap. The other thing is uh, looking at your swappiness, which is as it sounds. It's an actual <laughs> oh, word. <I'm> swappy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an actual word in Linux. Swappiness has to do with how um, quickly um, Linux is going to decide that, uh, that it needs to swap your memory to the hard drive. So what I'll do, it, it's not overly complicated, but I'll, I'll send you a link on Linux.com, uh, let's see, there is, there's an article all about Linux swap space. And it's a little dated. It goes back to 2007, but it does carry uh, some of those commands that you're going to want to use in order to see your swappiness, for example, or change your swappiness, both temporarily and permanently, uh, using the swappiness file or the syscontrol file. Um, so look at that. I'll, uh, here, let's see if I can throw you a link right now. the neat thing about owning the server. Okay, cat5.tv slash swap is going to take you to that link. And uh, so those of you who are interested in learning more about the uh, the way that Linux swaps and all that, it's a good article, actually. Uh, I've referred to it in the past, so check that out. cat5.tv slash swap. Cool. Thank you for the question. All right. So from Joe, a.k.a. JFSCC. Says, hey, Joe. Robbie, with regards to providing a DVD and ISO of the web development classes you and Krista did would be great. Thanks. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, last week, I think we were talking about yeah, the, pot the potential of creating a DVD that would be downloadable as an ISO. So it's good to know that. Uh, so that's plus one for Joe uh, for going with a DVD ISO. Good to know. Thank you very much. Good. So from Shiraz. If oh, I hey, use... Shiraz. Oh. Love your wine. <laughs> Because if I use external hard drive from a security <laughs> system with eight cameras, will it work? Will a one terabyte hard drive be good? How many days would that record? Okay, yeah, um, that should work just fine. I mean, a, a terabyte is a huge amount of space, right? Uh, basically, it's more, you know, you're looking at layman's terms, a thousand mm -hmm. gigabytes, mm -hmm. which is like an incredible amount of recording time. You think about the modern... Um, camera recorder, so your your modern system for doing surveillance, one of the things that it does is it uses motion capture. So uh, it doesn't actually record 24-7. It records when it captures movement. So if there's movement, it starts recording. If there's no movement, it stops recording. So the amount of space that it's going to take is going to be relative to how much movement there is in the screen. If you If your cameras are pointed out at the road, and there's cars going by, it's going to basically be recording all the time. If, however, it's in a shop and, and the, the blinds are closed and it's just to record uh, people walking uh, within the building, you're probably going to be recording a, a, a substantial amount less. On a terabyte hard drive, uh, it would be estimated to, to be able to record non-stop. So if you push record and let it record non-stop, you'd be looking at about a thousand hours of video give or take, right? It depends on the quality of the video that you're recording. It depends on um, the lossiness of the video, for example. Uh, but as I say, you're probably not going to be recording nonstop. It's going to be stop and go as the, uh, as the video, uh, as the system captures movement. A couple of things I would consider, though, you talk about putting in a, a one terabyte hard drive into your surveillance system. There's two things. One, how easy is it for somebody to come in and steal that unit? Let's say somebody broke in, and, and I don't know the scenario, okay? But uh, what, what kind of redundancy is in place? So if it is just a hard drive, if it's just a hard drive in a computer, could somebody just take that? 
knowing where it's located and and be able to completely circumvent the the, the purpose in having that system. <coughs> Secondly, <laughs> what happens if your hard drive crashes? Do you have a redundancy as far as a RAID setup goes? So if if the hard drive crashes, you need to think about, you know, can I have another hard drive that is mirroring this data? So those are a couple of things that I would uh, I would think about. And that said, um, if if you uh, okay, the other question was how long, mm -hmm. and I actually calculated this um, based on thousand hours. That would be forty one days continuous recording, which you're not going to do. So a terabyte is like insane for plenty <laughs> for for what you're doing. Yeah, but it makes sure there's redundancy. Make sure there's two hard drives. Make sure there's something off site uh, or at least uh, another device within the building that's also mirroring the data uh, would be my suggestion. So, okay. Thank you very much for the question. I hope that uh, hope that answers it for you. All you right. have more for me? I do. I'm going to grab a couple of the questions from the chat room. Fantastic. So Chris Reich, and I hope I said your name right. I'm sorry. I say Reich. Oh, so you well. So you tell us, Chris. Uh, Which who's, is it? <laughs> who's, who's right? Is it Robbie <laughs> or Krista? Anyways, right. he says, do you have a preferred file system, and if so, why? FAT16. <laughs> it depends on the application as far as, and, and that's kind of like an opinion thing and, and depends on what you're, what you're doing with it. Um, and it depends on what kind of system it's going in. Obviously, if I'm going to be running Windows, I'm, I'm going to want NTFS because then it, it's really easy to, to access it from both Linux and Windows. But... I don't. Uh, I don't have any particular preference. So I'm running EXT4 open. on my systems. I've got UPSs, so I feel safe doing that. <laughs> I used to really love uh, the Reaser file system, and I, and I still, you know, Reaser is is fantastic. It always was, but if you know the history behind the the creator Hans Reaser, um, it it it's kind of become a dead project, unfortunately. I don't think anyone's really picked it up. Reaser 4 was uh, was going to be just spectacular. And I do use Reaser, uh, the Unraid system uses Reaser FS, and that's part of the reason it's able to do a lot of the stuff it does. But on my system, it's uh, it's it's going to be EXT4 for most Linux systems, uh, but it could be EXT3, depending if I've got a UPS or not on that system, because I wouldn't trust... Uh, ext4 necessarily if there was a power outage or something like that because um, it, I might have data loss in that case so. cool good. I'm go. still waiting to hear who says uh, who says uh, the last name right he says good <laughs> answer Robbie thank you but is it reek or Reich or Rick or rich that's what we want to know what We're did very you say? curious I think huh? I said reach like reach like I oh, tried to make it kind of I tried to make it fancy. Kind of Spanish yeah, cool. I don't know. That I was wasn't, trying to sound educated. Sorry, I just I offended a lot of Spanish <laughs> people. <laughs> Terribly Write sorry. Write your hate that. mail to you know. <laughs> <laughs> Krista at category hey. five dot TV. Sure. All right. Oh, here's another question here from JVSCC. Uh, it says, long time ago, you showed how to use Synaptic Package Manager to add effects to Windows. So, for example, Windows would act like a burst into flames when you open and closed it. Um, can oh. we still do this in the new OS? Okay, uh, Windows being not Windows the operating system, Windows as in uh, the Windows in our Linux system, the applications ah, that are running. Yes. Not to be confused. Uh, JVSCC has it right in the chat room. It's called Compiz. Uh, way back <coughs> in the day, it was Barrel. Then it became Compiz Fusion. Well, uh, originally it was Compiz. It branched out because Compiz was going the route of the professional desktop with cool effects. Barrel wanted to create all these cool flaming... Uh, closing windows and beam me up Scotty window openers and things <laughs> like that. It was more the fun route. But then they came back together and now it became Compiz Fusion. It's, it's the base of Unity. It's the base of a lot of the stuff that we see in Linux, but a lot of the stuff is stripped down. So if you get the extra plugins, the add-on uh, plugins for Compiz and install Compiz Config Settings Manager, which is CCSM uh, in Synaptic, then you'll be able to set up some stuff. But if you're running Unity, be very, very careful running CCSM because you can actually break Unity very, very easily. And that's why we pulled Unity from Perfect Ubuntu this year because it's just too easy to break Unity. 
But yes, Comp is Fusion, CCSM to control it, and you're good to go. It, it, uh, a lot of stuff won't work with Unity there, J JVS, CC, um, but some of it will. Some of the effects will. Uh, you can't use Desktop Cube without some pretty big hacks, and, and it doesn't really work the way that you want it to. Um, if you're using Unity, you can try some of those effects. I'm sure that they, that they wouldn't break it, but keep a backup of your comp is settings as well, and then it's easy to revert to. So, Okay. Cool. Cool, cool. So, from Kevin. Hey, Kevin. He says, hi, Robbie and gang. Hello. Hello. Do you know of a software way to emulate a COM port via a USB port in Linux or Windows? Free or paid, free is much better. Wow. I bricked a router and need to revive it using serial connection on the router's main board from a USB port. Thanks. Chat room, what do you got for him? <laughs> Kevin wants a COM emulator software for USB. I would always have just thought to go the route myself. And, and how often do you encounter the need for a COM port um, these days? I use... Uh, no, I think he. I think he means uh, the ability. Uh, Amazing Gadwill saying use the terminal. Uh, I think what what they mean is to actually uh, create a connection. Am I right? SMC routers have a real serial port, but I get the impression that maybe the computer doesn't. It, it depends. Yeah, there's so many different ways to look at this question. See, when when you read that, I was thinking along the lines of needing to turn a USB cable into a COM port, which I would just use an adapter for. Um, a. Jameson wants to know if you're using a commercial router. Jonathan, I'm. that's how I interpreted the question. A USB to serial adapter, which is the easiest way to connect a serial to serial just by plugging in USB. Um, mm -hmm. I got you, Chris Reich. Uh, yeah, okay, so right. I, I have been saying it right. Rhymes with like, I've been wrong. Robbie gets 100 viewer points. <laughs> I think that's... I'm That's on my way. Biased. I'm on my hmm. well, you know. I think I think I should get some viewer points for that. Yeah, about a hundred. That's <laughs> greedy. That's. I could send myself a picture of me watching <laughs> Category Five on my device, Ooh. wearing a cardigan. Now I'd win. Made a whole music like video about that. it. <laughs> Show off. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, for the win, there's a thousand <laughs> points. <laughs> I don't have a suggestion for that one. That's just going too old school for me, and I'm not I'm not into the hardware hacking anymore. So, boy oh boy, um, chat room, if you have any suggestions, let us know. Um, and in the meantime, Kevin, you can check the chat logs for episode number 193 after the fact. Uh, Timestamp right now is 723, um, so you'll be able to scroll down to about 720 and start to see the conversation there. And yeah, I I I would just use the USB to serial adapter. Sorry about that. So we're going to jump into the news in just a couple of minutes, but uh, one of the things that I wanted to show last week that kind of failed was, <laughs> was your viewer locations. I, I think it's the coolest feature, but of course, if I'm live on the air and I say, okay, Nothing everybody works. go to viewer, lo viewer locations, then everybody hits it all at once, and, and plus we've got all the viewers that are watching, and it, it seemed to run really, really slow, really terribly. So I just want to give some shouts out to some of our viewers from all over the world. <clears throat> I'm looking at the United States here. Uh, Mannheim, just kind of clicking around Greenville. Uh, Decatur, Mansfield. Sorry if I mispronounce your, your city. Uh, there's Haines City. What else have we got? Mesa and uh, Sacramento. Nice to have everybody joining us. Auburn, United States. Moving up into Canada, there's Lethbridge, Alberta. We've got uh, Quesnel, Fort McMurray. Also in Alberta and Regina, Saskatchewan. We've got, uh, there's one in the States there, Duluth. Uh, Little Current here in Canada. St. Jacques, welcome. Uh, St. John in New Brunswick and uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Nice to see everybody joining us uh, tonight. Moving further south. We've got Cuba and Puerto Rico. Nice to have you watching the show. Uh, the Virgin Islands, Venezuela, Colombia, Brazil, uh, Santo uh, Andre in Brazil, uh, Santiago del... Oh, I'm moving too quick. Sorry, Santiago. 
<laughs> so nice to see so many people joining us from all over the world. That last one was in Chile. Um, it's it's really exciting to have you uh, joining us here. Uh, someone there joining us in South Africa tonight. Hey, good to see you uh, in Nairobi. Uh, joining us in Kenya for tonight's show. Accra, Ghana. Interesting to have some people here from uh, from Ghana joining us tonight in Nicaragua or Nigeria. Pardon me, that was. Um, Senegal, uh, Algeria, and Spain. Moving up into Germany area. Over here we've got Glasgow, United Kingdom uh, joining us tonight. It looks like we pretty much cover the entire UK, Manchester, and all the... Uh, there's Birmingham, I see, uh, quite a few viewers. and Nice to see you. Look at our, our representation here in, in Germany. Nice to see so many viewers uh, joining us from over there. Just moving a little bit further east, uh, down south, we've got Italy, uh, viewers in Italy, a couple down there, uh, some viewers uh, also in Greece. viewers in Israel. Nice to have you joining us tonight. Uh, if you see your uh, your dot, make sure you say, hey, that's me in the chat room. We've got uh, representation in India. We've got viewers there, as you can see. Moving further east, I see uh, some viewers in Thailand. I feel like I'm I'm talking into the that that mirror on what is it polka dot door, <laughs> but it's exciting to to have people joining us from Hong Kong. It's nice to have you here in Taiwan, in the Philippines there, Indonesia is represented. We've got uh, quite a few viewers there. Australia is. Uh, we have a growing viewership in uh, in Australia. We welcome our uh, our viewers there. People right along the coast near Sydney. New Zealand, right there in Christchurch. It's nice to have you joining us tonight. And also up in Auckland. And that's uh, that's that's our representation for tonight. Uh, you can get. You can actually view the map live. Uh, you can go to our website, category5.tv, click on About Us. Oh, and there's somebody actually up there in Iceland as well. That's very cool, just as I'm, I'm catching this. And back to uh, Canada as well. Nice to have a viewer uh, from Iceland. It's, it'll be interesting to see um, as the, uh, the viewer locations kind of move around the map. And, and uh, I've, I've been watching it kind of to see kind of the times that people are watching the show, and it's quite interesting. So... Nice to see everybody. Hey, if you saw yourself in the chat room let, or in the uh, in that uh, clip of our uh, overhead map, make sure you let me know. And uh, that's very cool. Um, in the meantime, um, uh, yeah, I was just thinking that it's it's neat to see uh, all the viewers and kind of have an overview. I, I know by numbers how how many of you there are, and it's it's really quite nice to to kind of be able to put a geographical kind of overview on that and and see where you're coming from. So. Um, if you've never contacted us before, pop me an email live at category5.tv. If you want to just submit a viewer testimonial as well, you can do that off of our website through the Interact menu, and uh, that would mean a lot to us. Uh, I know we've got viewers all over the world, and it's uh, it's really exciting. But as I was saying, go to our website, category5.tv, and from that website, you'll be able to click on About Us, and then you'll see the viewer location map, and that's your spot to, uh, to be able to get um, to see the overview that you just saw there. Cool. So we're going to head over to the newsroom. Hillary's joining us here. And uh, Hillary, I'll let you take that away. Surprise, everyone. The magic of television. And now we have our lovely news from the Category 5.TV newsroom. Skype users were unable to access the popular internet phone service after it suffered a worldwide technical failure on Thursday, just two weeks after it was purchased by Microsoft for 5.2 billion pounds. 
Users worldwide were unable to make calls or log in to Skype's instant messenger, and the product's website was also offline. In a series of updates on Twitter, Skype claimed the problems affected a small number of its more than 66 million users, but more than two hours later, no further information was available, and users across Europe, the US, and Asia had reported that the software crashed on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Apple CEO Steve Jobs will take the stage at the company's developer conference next week to introduce iCloud, Apple's new cloud service, and the next version of its mobile operating system, iOS 5. In a statement today, Apple announced that Jobs, who remains um, an, in, an indefinite, oh, he's on indefinite medical leave, huh. he'll take part in the, uh, the keynote section that opens the worldwide developers conference on June 6th. Jobs and other company executives will highlight the next version of Mac OS X, nicknamed Lion, during the keynote, as well as iOS 5 and iCloud, the name Apple stuck on whatever it described as its upcoming cloud services offering. Moving along, Linus Torvalds, the granddaddy of the Linux kernel, has announced that the next version of the Linux kernel release is to be 3.0. He says, I decided to just bite the bullet and call the next version 3.0. It will get released close enough to the 20 year mark, which is an excuse enough for me. Although honestly, the real reason is just that I can no longer comfortably count as high as 40. Linux says we are very much not doing a KDE 4 or a GNOME 3 here. No breakage, no special scary new features, nothing at all like that. We've been doing time based releases for many years now. This is in no way about features. Um, he goes on to say that there's absolutely no reason to aim for the traditional zero or point zero problems that so many projects typically have. Instead, the release will work on testing the build scripts for the numbering changes, but will also include the usual two third driver changes and a lot of random fixes and some nice uh, VFS cleanups, various VM fixes. He then goes on to say, um, and name a few more techno babbles. Hmm. All to say, it's just another day in the life of Linux with more improvements and a new number. Did you know when you buy a Linux based smartphone, you might actually be paying Microsoft? Hmm. Thanks to a patent settlement with HTC over intellectual property infringement, Microsoft reportedly gets $5 for every HTC phone running Android. This has been revealed by City Analyst Walter Pritchard, who released a lengthy report about Microsoft Friday morning. Pritchard says we can expect more legal activity to pick up around Android in the coming months because he says that Google appears to have very little intellectual property to defend itself with. This is good for Microsoft, which is about to enter the tablet market and is trying to make a dent in the smartphone market too. You can get these full stories online at category5.tv slash newsroom. The category5.tv newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from our fabulous community of viewers. If you have a story you think is worthy of on-air mention, send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv. From the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Hillary, thank you so much. It's You're nice welcome. to see you back. Thank you. Nice to have you back in Good studio with like no lag. In real life. <laughs> I can only imagine what people heard last week. Well, phone, we were talking. Seeing, you were talking about Skype yeah. there and how they they massively failed it already. And uh, we, I think we, it wasn't you. I think uh, it might have been this uh, <laughs> this guy up on my screen. Unbelievable. Not necessarily him specifically. Right. Of course. I think a lot of people are losing faith in Skype, mm -hmm. and not only that, but a little bit afraid of where Microsoft is going to take it. They overpaid for it, and it's it's such a weird scenario. I don't know. Yeah what's going to happen there but but it's nice to have you back Thank without you. uh without the and the stuttering and the <laughs> skypiness mm -hmm. yes good to be here enjoying your summer oh yeah so far it's, it's not fabulous. even summer but it feels it like feels it. like summer today i was roasting live yeah pretty much so yeah it's good, good to see you i'm back smile for the camera we've got this cool camera set up we, so. <laughs> we do we've been like staging photos throughout there we um go. so i probably look stunned oh i kind of look stunned you can see the screen <laughs> below and uh while robbie was talking i was like eh, posing for pictures so there's like gonna be some yeah interesting ones yeah there okay. will be some interesting ones tonight i look stunned i can't do this <laughs> i can't go on take me out of here thanks for being here hillary <laughs> good to see you
Uh, tonight's uh, episode of Category 5 Technology TV is, of course, brought to you by Pogo Plug, and you'll find them online, cat5.tv slash Pogo Plug. And Planet Calypso, you can join me in the free online universe. Make sure you join our society. You can download the free game at cat5.tv slash Calypso. I'm talking about uh, the the camera setup that we have uh, here tonight. And uh, one of the interesting things about it... Oh, hi. Oh, hello. That was interesting. Is that uh, it actually snaps pictures on a regular occurrence, and, and this is our way of we're, we're trying to increase the quality of the photos that are on our, on our website. And uh, we thought it'd be fun tonight to have a little, a little game where we can, we can present our viewers with an opportunity to, you know, we can make faces or we can mm-hmm. do all these wonderful things. <laughs> if you have an idea in the chat room, we're there live. Uh, it's uh, category5.tv. Before the show, it was kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Well, before the show was always fun. There are some photos. I don't know if you noticed when you were talking there, but I might have been making faces at the I camera. I didn't notice. Is that what you're snickering? Is that, <laughs> whenever snickering. you see the can, whenever you see it move over like that, that's when you know I'm pretty much over here <laughs> and contorted. I, I don't really know oh. what happens, but uh, just to give you an idea. Well, you see, that's not fair because no one sees you do it, so it's like it pretty much goes (laughs) under the radar. (laughs) That's nice. Yeah. (laughs) That's how he looks like 99% of the time. 99% of the time. (laughs) Good Good guy thinks that the the microphone on my face uh, drives him nuts. Almost looks like it's a a little surgically added addition or something. Uh, Well... Uh, and we had that thought, and and you know, it's do we do we go for the cosmetic of it, or do we go for the audio quality of it? And I think we found mm-hmm. that obviously the the headset provides the best possible sound. Uh, what are your thoughts? Be interested to know. This, of course, is a loner that uh, has been so graciously lent to us to to get through the time that we're down two microphones. Uh, it's been lent to us by Music Pro on the south end of Barrie. We'd invite you to say thanks to them by uh, paying them a visit if you're in the area. Um, Greg in Texas, I, I'm with you there. That it, it sounds great, and that's that's really what we need to be mainly concerned about. You know, does it really does it really make a difference that uh, does it really make a difference to you that there's a, a dot on my face? You know, personally, could be worse. I think you could add some nice like rhinestones or Thank something, you. and then yeah. you know, get the, like the and then the, like the hair flip, and the hair you flip. would be an instant pop star. Singing. Like yeah. Britney Spears watch. I'd out. have to like stride onto the the set every time. Mm-hmm. Krista's using a lapel, uh, which you can point out to them. But uh, her lapel is the one lapel that uh, that we have that uh, that functions correctly after the power surge. So, yeah. Let us know your thoughts about uh, about the microphone because we are still in that time where you know we're not sure what the best option is. I think that this audibly is is the best option, and it doesn't pick up a lot of. Uh, a lot of background noise either so hmm. good cool that is but we're good. not committed to it it's a loner um, so love to know hey anybody joining us that's uh, that's brand new here uh, in the chat room category 5.tv can you let us know uh, we'd love to say greets out to you and get your questions in JVSCC Mike works great cool one of the things that I've been working on uh, lately, and, I, and this is just kind of a precursor mm-hmm. to actually having a, a feature put together that we're going to be working on. Uh, one of the things I've been working on is, is as you can imagine, as a programmer, I, I type a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm at my computer a lot, and I'm using the mouse a lot, like to the point of it's ridiculous, and, and it, it can get pretty painful at times. So one of the things I've been working on is improving the ergonomics of my workstation. And so over the next little while, we're g- you're going to be... Uh, able to um, get in on some of the, the steps that I'm taking to, uh, to personally uh, keep myself well uh, through the course of my career. Uh, first thing that I did is I bought a, tr- uh, a trackball. Logitech has the, the Wingman uh, trackball, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. And it's fantastic, but they're really, really hard to get. And apparently Logitech says they just people don't buy them. Oh, I and used to have one too, and I found it was fantastic yeah, until I switched really to the tablet. Well, you've switched to the tablet, and you've mm-hmm. got that precision of being able to draw. Yeah, yeah, but I found like the, the same thing that, what's it called, the trackball? 
Yeah. Yeah, I found it was great. Once you get the hang of it, it's yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it took uh, it took a couple of days to get used to it. Now I'm just flying on it. But yeah. but you're saying they're hard to find, like find in stores. They don't even have them on their website. Oh. Wow. Well, they have one on their website, but it's not the one that I bought. The one that I bought is more ergonomic. Mm-hmm. The one that's on their website is more like a gaming trackball or oh, something. Okay. So I'm not sure hmm. really what's going on there. I w- I'd like to do a little bit more research. Um, one of the other things that I unfortunately found was that Microsoft makes really good keyboards, or at least they hmm. bought, uh, pay a company to put their logo on it. Um, <laughs> but they've got the natural curve keyboards, and they're they're fantastic as far as the keyboard goes. Um, so that's one step is also to to replace my keyboard with something where I don't know if you if you notice when you're sitting at your desk, but when I was sitting at my desk, I had my hands kind of like this because I've got kind of a you know wide shoulder base, so my hands are always kind of crooked here at my wrist. So so I was getting a lot of pain in my wrist. Hmm. Now with this new keyboard, I'm not like this. I'm like that, and so my hands are just kind of in front of me, 90 degree angle at the at the elbow, and hmm. feels really good after only two days. Have to take a little it. adjustment though, would it? Like a taking bit. a little getting used to. I'm still sometimes missing a couple of the higher keys. But I'm getting mm-hmm. used to it, and I think it's uh, it's working good. Um, Chris Reich uh, uses a Wacom tablet um, for severe carpal tunnel syndrome, and it's literal uh, that has literally disabled him. And how do you find that, Chris? And how do you find the Wacom tablet as far as ergonomics go, and and being able to use that as a You know, I absolutely love it. I haven't found any kind of uh, um, stress like anything that I haven't had before, but I'm also probably the worst person to ask. Um, I tend to not, I sit every which way except for proper. This is probably the longest I've ever sat, um, just like straight, usually like my knees up here, or I'm sitting cross-legged, or, you know. (laughs) So, who knows, maybe because I'm moving around so much, I, right. I don't know. But yeah, I found that uh, wrist-wise or anything like that, I haven't found any kind of uh, stress or... Mm-hmm. random pains or and anything like that. How many that, hours so. at a time do you use it? Oh, about six hours. Yeah, so and then I'll, good, you know, full day. go home and do some more computer work. So about right. another four hours, probably about 10 hours a day. Right. Interested to hear how Chris has found it with, with having that really bad carpal tunnel. Now, I have ulnar nerve entrapment, which is kind of the opposite of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, which you can look up. And that affects the... Uh, the pinky side of my hand versus carpal tunnel, which is your thumb side. Um, so really, uh, I'm trying to get that under wraps. So with my keyboard, another thing that I'm working on uh, learning is I want to get away from the QWERTY typing, which yeah. is really going to be the biggest challenge for me, and this is why I wanted to bring this up, is it's going to be kind of an adventure for me because I've been typing QWERTY. QWERTY being, if you look at your keyboard up at the top left, it starts with Q-W-E-R-T-Y. And that is a QWERTY keyboard. That's the layout of the keys. And do you know where that layout came from? You know, I heard once, but it was a long time ago, and All I right. couldn't. It was I a long try. time ago. Remember those old typewriters that <laughs> had that little <laughs> the thing that hits the ribbon? Yeah. They used to get jammed really bad. Like I don't know if this was like in the 1300s or something. Mm. Not really, but <laughs> way way back, right? They would get jammed. So what they did is they positioned the keys in such a way that you know it it would not jam the the typewriter because you were alternating from left to right kind of thing. Oh, I see. So the most common letter combinations that you're using are right beside each other. Yeah, like they put in an insane amount of mm-hmm. research into making it as not jammable as possible. So that's what we're what is transcended over to computer keyboards. So we're still using this QWERTY keyboard, but it doesn't make any sense on a computer because there's mm-hmm. no arms to jam. So let's look at it from a different perspective. Let's look at it from an ergonomic perspective, and that's where Dvorak key layouts come out. But surprisingly, you can't really find any Dvorak keyboards. So I got on eBay, and for $3 or something like that, I was able to buy um, some stickers that hmm. I'm going to be sticking on my brand new keyboard once they arrive. So all this is going to be documented, but uh, look up Dvorak, D-V-O-R-A-K, and you'll find out more. And that's basically a keyboard layout that's been designed so that your keys never or your hands rarely leave the home row. So if you hover your, your fingers over the you know the F and J and put your fingers in the right spot, you're pretty much just staying in one spot and you're going like this rather than like this all over the place and getting cramps and stuff like that. So that's one of the um, more challenging things that I'm going to be doing because I type fast, but I type QWERTY. And I have all my life. I spent a lot of hours at the computer. Life is it's too gonna be, boring. It's going to be really different. It's like it's like it, I don't know what to expect. Hmm. 
it would be to me it, it seems like it's going to be like if I went into a country where I don't know the language and I was forced to learn that language in order to understand. I'm going to be sitting down to a keyboard that's going to be completely changed layout. The keys are not going to be anywhere near where I'm used to them being. And I'm going to have to retrain my mind. Am I going to be able to then go to a QWERTY computer and be able to type as fast as I used to? Or am I going to be stuck with Dvorak on all my computers? Who knows? Does anyone in the chat room use Dvorak? Would be interesting to know. Do you have any more viewer questions as we... Uh oh, I think I could scrounge up a couple. All right. There was one here earlier, and I have to apologize if, I, if I've missed anyone in the chat room. Um, so if I have missed your question, you might want to repost. But a uh, good guy says, is there any way to make a Ustream, or sorry, to make a Ustream Windows without the web page border? You mean like lose the without the the decorations on your on your window? Like Ustream just uses Flash, right? So if that's what you mean, the the window decorations are caused by your browser, not by Ustream. So you could disable the window decorations if you use Compiz or something like that. Um, wants just everything, but the just wants the actual video. I I think what you mean is that, um, the the window decorations, the borders, which are your operating system, not not Ustream specific. So so I'm not sure on that. But y if you're using Linux, Compass Config Settings Manager has that in it. Um, Emerald has that if you use Emerald. Have the ability to at least thin out. I think with Windows you can make the border like one pixel and it's virtually invisible. Does that help at all? Um, if if you want, what you could do is also use the embed code, which would give you a close to, like, I'm trying to interpret the question, but maybe what <laughs> you mean is is you want to get off of the Ustream page, like you want to take that video and and remove it from all the wrappers and stuff on that website. If that's what you mean, as opposed to looking at a pop up, I'm thinking in terms of a pop up, then you could use the embed code and just paste it into an HTML file and just open that with Firefox. And it doesn't have to be on a server anywhere. You can just, if you call it like uh, ustream.html or name of show.html, category 5.html, paste the embed code into that and then uh, open it, then uh, it would just open in Firefox with nothing else around it, if that makes sense. Uh, but you will have uh, what's called margins and padding. So, um, look at the source code for one of our embedded players, click on uh, just to play any one of our videos and see how we remove the padding from the body tag and the margins. Otherwise you're going to have a couple of pixels of white border around your video. Cool. Any other questions? Any email? Live at category5.tv. Uh, we have our top 10 uh, videos based on your votes on our website category5.tv. I'd encourage you to uh, click on one of the five stars for every episode that you see. Tonight's episode, of course, if you're watching live, will be on our website within about two hours after we sign off the air. And uh, I'd invite you to, to click on how you liked the episode from one to five, and that uh, that will impact how uh, things are interpreted for our top ten. It's kind of a no-brainer, though. It's a five, right? Definitely. Five. Definitely five. <laughs> Uh, Chris Reich says, in the past, uh, I used one of those MS ergonomic keyboards and can recommend it. Uh, here, I use a Logitech uh, Comfort Curve keyboard, I think it was. Uh, it doesn't say on the, de on the device what it's called. And uh, I did a review many, many moons ago, and I really do like the keyboard, but it's not as split as the Microsoft. So with the Microsoft one, I'm really feeling like my hands are straight. I'm not curved at all. This one has got a nice curve to it, but it's, it, I still have to kind of twist my arms a little bit. So It is a comfort curve, Amazing Gadwill uh, <laughs> confirms. Cool. Do we have any... Uh, we've got only is. a couple minutes There's left, but get your questions in. One more question, um, and it is from Rex Damien. Hey, Rex. He says, hey, Robbie, maybe you can help me with this project. I'm making a wikia.com page for watching Canadian TV online, a sort of TV guide for watching stuff online. I'm totally mm. new to it, but I learned quick. It's at internet, internettvcanada.wikia.com. Okay. 
Okay. I've got a table in there so far that I'm going to populate. Now the thing is, I want to have a page for each of those shows, and I want to have an info box that will pull data from that table. Is that possible, or do I have to edit every page and input mm. that data on every page? I actually cut off my cable TV um, and saved myself some money by now just watching everything online. So in the spirit of free, cool. <laughs> I'd like to make this site so that others can enjoy the savings too. Now, of course, that of being in Canada is only going to work for Canadian viewers. So if you create a site like that, most likely, because you're linking to legitimate videos like on cbc.ca, they've got a, a great resource there. Global is another uh, website that, that carries pretty much all their shows. You can watch the full-length show. And the way that they fund that is it has where you normally would have commercials, it has web advertisements. Um, so they're just like television commercials, but it's programmed in such a way that you can click it and you can get around at that commercial break. So it's kind of interesting. And I think that's that's a really neat way that uh, the Internet can, can um, take us to the next level as far as multimedia content goes. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. So if you're creating a repository or a list of, of these kinds of uh, sites and, and places that you can go to watch your shows, uh, of course you want to keep it legitimate. You don't. You want to be very careful. And I know that your your goal here. I'm looking at the first paragraph. It says that these are legal, uh, legal, not illegal, legal online shows for Canadians, um, and that's that's what you want to stick to, of course. But then, to answer your question, as far as getting things from a database, uh, the neat thing about using a database is that you don't have to. Were you smiling silly <laughs> at the camera? It's not zoomed in on me, so everybody saw that. I know. That. I know. I was hoping they were just focusing on you, though. Just focus you know, on me. You know, because you were talking and I wasn't. But you were sitting there going, <laughs> so, I mean, that you know that they're focused on you. It's well, there's never actually a good time for me to do it because of the same. <laughs> what were you thinking there? I just think it's unfair. <laughs> that's all. I think that everyone is privileged and they get to see the whole three seconds into the picture first. And then, you know. Okay. Right. That's, that's good, right. right? Okay. Sorry about that. We uh, we digress. <laughs> <laughs> Rex Damien, uh, the neat thing about databasing and and if you if you get into coding it from a database perspective and and realizing that a database really means that your site is now dynamic and you you've got the ability to interpret that data any way that you like. I'm just kind of looking. At I know. I see you glancing. Sure is that, she doing it? Yeah. You know. Is she <laughs> is doing it? Is it happening? Do I need to like? Okay. I'll zoom in on me and then mm -hmm. she can. You, you don't even know what's going on over there. Stop that, weirdo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> With databasing, you could have, for example, Rex, one file that's a PHP file. It could be just called, uh, you know, shows.php. And then you can have that connect to your database and pull all the data, aggregate it, put it out in the format that you like, and it could, and then it'd be interpreted using something like uh, HT Access. Apache has HT Access, which means, so now you could go to mydomain.com slash uh, global. And it would automatically bring up player.php question mark play equals global or something like that. So th there's all different things that can be done, and it can be done without having to code a whole bunch of pages. Whether Wikia will allow you to do it or not, I can't be certain because it is a, a wiki website. But is it something that uh, that they support? I don't know. But if you get your own hosting package, then definitely you can do any of those things. So f fill us in a little bit more on, on what you hope to accomplish as far as the the way that it's going to work, and I'd be happy to at least take a look. And if I can make some suggestions, or if possible, I'll, I'll even provide a hand. So, um, But uh, you know, it's interesting to, to see you working on that. Be interested to see where, where it goes. Make sure you stick Category 5 on there somewhere. <laughs> cool. We've got a couple minutes left if anyone uh, has another question for us. Live at category5.tv. Seriously. Hmm. <laughs> What's wrong came? with that? <laughs> she didn't see. Browsing. <laughs> yeah, I just brought up a photo. <laughs> That's nice. I know. Oh, it's been fun having everybody here. I, I still have time for another question if, uh, if you've got one to throw my way. Final blogger just asked kind of a generic question: Which desktop desktop system do you suggest he buys? Mm -hmm. And it is uh, you're right; it is kind of generic. And, you and mean besides a Mac? Like if your yeah. Mac is out of the question. If you have money to throw away, why not throw it my way? And I'll build you a nice computer that's PC, and I'll I'll keep the change. Hmm. Hmm. Does it glow? <laughs> 
I could make it glow. Oh. Somebody send me a Dremel and a light bulb. (laughs) 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 What kind of UPS do I have? We have a commercial grade 1,000 volt amp um, uh, UPSs. They're, um, I don't I think they were compact, so HP. Uh, But after the most recent surge, I've kind of lost a lot of faith in getting uh, in using these commercial UPSs. Somebody said to me, well, why don't you get something that has uh, a lesser battery backup but has the warranty? And that's that's exactly what I'm intending to do. I actually found a a, a surge suppressor, just a 4200 joule surge suppressor, which I'm going to put some of our stuff on still looking into whether or not it's safe to daisy chain this one because some things are safe mm. to daisy chain some things aren't depending on the way that the surge suppressor functions but what turned me on to this is that it comes with a thirty five a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar warranty so the way that i'm looking at it is even if we went without a ups <laughs> if we had a surge like we did recently i mean we're we're struggling to raise three thousand dollars to to replace the damaged hardware mm-hmm. and, and i and i say that with absolute respect and thanks to everyone who's supported us uh, over the past several weeks and we're and we're coming along but it's really tough to raise that kind of money when you don't have a registered charity or Mm -hmm. um you know when when we're really calling on viewers to to show their support to help us through this problem wouldn't it have been so much simpler just to have a ups or a uh, surge protector that came with three hundred fifty thousand dollars of warranty so hey the surge comes it fries Mm -hmm. our server and we just replace it put it on warranty and it's done (laughs) <laughs> and in hindsight, that should have been what we had done. You know, I recommend it to, to home users. But because of the nature of the show, I always thought it's best to have really powerful, really high-grade UPSs. But they didn't come with any warranty. So kicking myself a little bit for that. Mm. But, uh, you know, we all learn as we go, learn from our mistakes. So Chris Reich agrees with the analysis. <laughs> So, so we'll see where that goes. Right now, we're we're at an impasse with our, our UPSs. We have uh, multiple different types of UPSs. Our lights are on UPSs. Every every one is different, and and you know every three years we replace the batteries. So, um, so that's you know maybe at that point a couple of them are are on their way out. We should have a look at uh, what we should do. So, <laughs> DOS Bomber had a, an APC UPS which caught fire as soon as they plugged it in. <laughs> That's interesting. I actually had a UPS that did that. And, and you think, that's scary. Like, if, if hmm. that kind of thing is going to happen in the house. And it reeked. It smelled, like, awful. And it probably toxic plastic fumes and whatever else. Okay. It wasn't an APC that I had. APC are pretty reliable. But, uh... Agamotto wondering about problems with EXT4 and UPSs. What are the issues? I don't think there's problems with them. EXT4, uh, the way that it journals the file system is a little bit different. So if the power goes out um, while you're making writes to the hard drive, then there's potential for data loss. Um, I'll see if I can find any information on that. I mean, you could probably do uh, EXT4 versus EXT3... in Google but you you'll find that it's it's hard to to know with one minute left of the show uh, what kind of links I give you but do some searching around and you know maybe you know you guys put me on the spot so much <laughs> <laughs> it's proof the show is live that's what happens yeah hmm Okay, watch Robbie think. It has to do with journaling. That's all I know. I don't know a lot about file systems. I know about when they come out and stuff. <laughs> but not their inner workings so much. Sorry. Cool. Uh, yeah, you'll you'll find that... Uh, well, I know when uh, Ubuntu first started using EXT4, there was all this kerfuffle about people being concerned about its safety. Uh, versus ext3 ext3 is so tried and true um, if your hard you know if your computer crashes it's easy to get the data off and stuff like that same with Reaser. Um ext4 I have nothing against it at all I love it it's fast 
but it also has it depends on you know look at the the verses in the search engines because there are advantages to each op, uh, to each file system depending on how large the files are that you're storing how frequently you're doing reads and writes things like that it uh, yeah, that would be a whole show in itself so. Well, cool. thank you everybody for uh, being with us tonight. It's been uh, it's been fun having you, and uh, we're looking forward to next week. Uh, next week we're going to be looking at video editing software for Linux, uh, which I'm very excited about. Cool. So, yeah, we're going to be learning all about that. You have yourself a great week. Oh, you too. Thank do. you. And, and you, you have guys a great as well. Week. <laughs> yeah. Pop me an email live at category5.tv this week. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, get your questions in if you weren't able to get them in during the live show. We'll uh, we'll love to get those in uh, next week for episode number 194. So. Check this one out uh, on our website. Don't forget to vote uh, for your favorite episodes, category5.tv. This is episode number 193, and I'm Robbie Ferguson. I'm Krista Wells. See ya. See you guys.